It's Wednesday, May 8th, 2013, and this is the Energy Education Podcast. I'm Kevin Hurley. Today on the show, we'll talk about a leak at the Palisades nuclear power plant in Michigan, what the risks from it are, and what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is doing or not doing about the problem. Also, yesterday marks the last day of operation at the Kiwani nuclear power plant. With nearly two decades left on their operating license, the plant's owners have decided to shut it down. We'll talk about why. This week, nuclear regulators from around the world are meeting in Japan behind closed doors. We'll discuss why all of the secrecy. Well, today I'd like to welcome Kevin Camps to the show. He's a radioactive waste specialist with Beyond Nuclear. Kevin, welcome. Thanks for having me. And of course, Arnie, welcome to the show. Hi, Kevin, and hi, Kevin. So I'd like to start out today by talking about the leaking Palisades nuclear power plant. For the past two years, the Palisades power plant has been leaking tritiated water. Last summer, the NRC granted a waiver to allow the Palisades plant to continue leaking tritiated water. Just recently, however, the five gallons per day that the plant has been leaking has increased to about 90 gallons a day. Kevin, can you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, you're right. It's interesting. There are diverse leaks happening at Palisades, but the one we're talking about today is a leak from a tank of water that holds 300,000 gallons. It's called the Safety Injection Refueling Water Storage Tank. And we first found out about this leak in a very obscure notification report from the NRC in early June of 2012, where they admitted there was a leak from this oddly named tank, but they didn't say very much about it. And we found out just a short time later from Representative Markey uh, from Western Massachusetts, who was working off of information provided by very courageous whistleblowers at Palisades and their attorney, Billy Perner Guard in Washington, D.C., that this leak was quite significant. In fact, the title of Representative Markey's press release was, There is a Crisis in the Control Room at Palisades. This leak from the Safety Injection Refueling Water Storage Tank was leaking through the ceiling into the control room and was being captured in buckets and also one liter plastic bottles of water, including right next to the main control panel in the center of the control room. And incredibly enough, the NRC staff and Entergy, which owns Palisades, had concealed this leak from the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, who toured Palisades on May 25th of 2012, and then met with about three dozen of us after his tour a short distance away in South Haven, Michigan. And none of us, including the chairman of the NRC, were informed about this leak, which at that time had been going on for a year. And, of course, the significance is that um, the control room is the nerve center for safety in the entire plant, safety and control. And if, you know, the leak were to find its way to safety, critical electrical circuitry or other control equipment, it could short it out. And we saw how serious that could be just the previous year, September 25th of 2011, Palisades suffered a 50% loss of power to the control room, which really threw the plant into chaos for several hours. So the most recent incident here involved the leakage not into the control room this time, but into Lake Michigan from this same tank. And reportedly around 80 gallons of radioactive water was discharged into Lake Michigan from this latest leak that just happened on the weekend. So, Kevin, where exactly is this tank located, and what is the water being held in the tank used for? Well, the the safety injection refueling water storage tank, incredibly enough, is located directly above the control room. And I had a chance encounter with NRC's, at that point, recently appointed new chairwoman, Allison McFarland. She stopped by an information table of Beyond Nuclear at a public event. And we were talking about the location of that tank. And she said, boy, that was not a very smart place to put that tank. And, you know, we'd have to agree with that. It's uh, a tank that's now 46 years old because Palisades was completed construction-wise in 1967. So this is another 46-year-old piece of equipment at Palisades that has sprung multiple leaks. And according to NRC and Entergy right now, they don't know where on this storage tank these current leaks are coming from. I think it's important to mention that this is an aluminum tank. There was an aluminum pipe at Oyster Creek a couple years ago that corroded out as well and released thousands and thousands of gallons of tritiated water into the sandy soil near the power plant. 
Here we are with an aluminum tank. I know why it's aluminum, because it was lightweight and it's sitting above the nuclear control room. But you know, rather than do it right, if you know you've got a leak, you owe it to the public to go in and fix it. Rather than do it right, what the NRC has done is grant a waiver for the last year. You know, I'm continually surprised at myself that I'm continually surprised about what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission allows licensees to get away with. But here's a plant that's been leaking for two years and severely leaking for one year. And rather than fix the problem, the NRC is just allowing these guys to get a waiver and start the thing right back up again. And a part of that complicity is just this agreement that whatever it is, 34 or 38 gallons per day of leakage from this tank is acceptable. Because, again, it's leaking into the vicinity of the control room, if not directly into the control room. And my concern has been, what if that leak were to all of a sudden shift direction and go someplace else in the control room? They are overconfident that they've got this leak captured in buckets. But they're obviously worried about a worse leak happening because we learned last year, thanks to the watchdogging by David Lockdown at Union of Concerned Scientists, that there is a flood control berm surrounding the Palisades control room. And my speculation has been that they are worried about a massive, a sudden failure of this 300,000-gallon tank of water that sends a wall of water heading towards the control room. You know, I'm reminded of that uh, the children's story about the, the little Dutch boy with his finger in the dike, you know, holding <laughs> the back of the water. So, you know, that's the approach that, that entities use, and they've decided to put their finger in the dike and, and hope that holds. But, you know, I think it's clear now for the last two years that the, the finger in the dike is not working, and it's time to, uh, to do it right. And, uh, you know, hopefully the, the NRC will say, you know, this is unacceptable. We've gotten to the point where it's got to stop. And the only way to stop is to shut down and repair this thing until you're assured there's no more leak. Um, you know, time will tell whether the NRC lets them off the hook again. But, you know, fixing a leak and then claiming that the remaining vessel has integrity uh, is, is beyond my imagination. You know, I didn't answer Kevin's question about what this tank does, what it's supposed to do. And it's used during refueling to flood the reactor cavity with water. And that's where it does pick up radioactive contamination like tritium and even particles, hot particles, could get into that water, which is then sent back to this tank. So they don't clean the water. It just can go back to the tank with the contamination in it. So the last leak, you know, a year ago... They emptied this tank, and we heard uh, from Palisades workers that they emptied the tank into trucks that sure did look like the kind of truck used for transporting milk. So I sure hope that's not the case and that it wasn't used for food after this because there's radioactive contamination in the water. And we also heard that there was a hot particle detected that had a pretty high radiation dose rate coming off of it that was found in the tank. So. There's significant radioactive contamination in this tank, and they're about to do that again. They're about to empty the entire tank so that they can take a closer look at, at where this leak happened. Well, this might be kind of a silly question, but from my own lay perspective, I would think uh, something so tightly controlled and organized as a nuclear power plant, if we're talking about a pool of water above the control room, I should imagine they would know the exact location of the leak, and then my question would be, what do they need to do to fix it? No, there's a lot of questions about the leaks that have gone on for two years. So last year when they emptied the tank and then they refilled it again, they had a, a period of days where there was still leakage going on, and they had just fixed the, the nozzles and other weak points on the tank that they suspected of the leakage. They actually put a new liner in this old tank to an extent. But the leaks continued immediately after refilling, and so they tried to blame that on precipitation from the environment uh, in the sand bed region under this tank, uh, they really don't know. They have a lot of unanswered questions. And the other service that this tank is supposed to provide is safety. That's the safety part of the, of the name. It is another reserve of water that could be used for cooling water during a reactor core emergency. But, you know, they're risking that not being there with that sudden uh, drain down that I mentioned involving that flood control burn. There might not be that 300,000 gallons of water if there's a, a sudden failure of this tank. You know, I think we need to bring up one other thing that Palisades has had more than its fair share of problems over the last couple of years. It's been shut down a whole bunch of times. 
it's about a dozen times they've had these euphemistically labeled unplanned shutdowns. These are breakdowns, these are leaks that have forced the reactor to be taken offline. And in fact, uh, Dave Lockbaum in his annual nuclear power safety uh, reports has documented that Palisades has had three near misses in the last two years. And the definition of a near miss in his report is when NRC has to send either a supplemental inspection team or an augmented inspection team to a reactor after an incident. Palisades has had three of those in the past two years, and it's uh, tied with Fort Calhoun, Nebraska, for second worst in the country, and the only plant in the country that's worse is Wolf Creek, Kansas, which has had four. And he was looking at a three-year spread. Palisades has had these three near misses just in the last two years. Well, you know, I think there's another piece of this puzzle. Palisades is owned by Entergy, and it's a, it's a merchant plant, which means that it just sells power to whoever wants to buy it. It's not owned by a, a public utility. And, you know, I was on the, uh, the Vermont Oversight Panel appointed by now Governor Shumlin, and in that role, uh, the Oversight Panel looked at Entergy, and, and we determined it's in our report. You go up on the web and read the report that says that Entergy doesn't spend enough money on repairs for the nuclear plants in their fleet. And, you know, it looks to me like the experience that we saw at Vermont Yankee is comparable, if not worse, as what's happening at Palisades. Oh, man, Arnie, there is such a long list of major safety repairs at Palisades that were essentially promised as part of the sale agreement from Consumers Energy to Entergy back in 2007. The previous owner said to the state of Michigan, to the Public Service Commission, we need to replace the reactor lid. It is badly degraded. We need to replace the steam generators for the second time in this plant's history. We need to deal with the fact that Palisades has the most embrittled reactor pressure vessel in the country. We need to upgrade fire protections. And none of those jobs have happened. Entergy has owned this plant now for six years. They are not willing to invest the money in those major safety repairs that are needed. So let's go to the other side of Lake Michigan and talk about the Kiwani plant. Yesterday, the Kiwani plant, after several decades, is closing down shop. Arnie? Yeah, the, the Kiwani plant is, is 38 years old, and it had already gotten a 20-year license extension for the NRC. So it could have run another 22 more years. And it was a merchant plant held by a, a company that determined that it wasn't making any money. Um, and so what they did was they decided, uh, we don't care if it's got 22 more years of, of license left, we're going to shut it down. And the shutdown occurred May 7th at noon. This is a plant that had no problems, that there were no, uh, no major problems with any of the safety systems. It just didn't make economic sense. So the plant was shut down yesterday. And what's going to happen is that the carcass of the plant is going to remain there for another 60 years. So, so do the math here. You got 38 years of life plus 60 years of sitting in this field. The plant's going to be 98 years old in something called Safe Store um, before it will be dismantled. You know, to my way of thinking, you know, the people enjoyed the benefit of electricity from that plant. And the people that enjoyed that benefit are the ones that should pay for it. But what we're doing is we're, we're committing a, a, a generational tyranny here. We're kicking the, the can down the road and, and forcing those costs onto uh, not just our kids, but our grandkids. Um, so 60 years from now, they'll still be paying for the electricity from a plant that only ran for 38 years. So let's now go to Japan and talk about the decommissioning of the Fukushima plant. Where does that stand? Yeah, there's some news coming out of Fukushima Daiichi Unit 3. TEPCO released a press release on, on Friday. And whenever a company releases a Friday press release, they're counting on nobody reading it over the weekend. We have a member of the board of Fairwinds Energy that did read it. And, and she determined that the, that the press release had just a lot of really bad news in it. They're, they're moving large beams on the top of the roof of the containment reactor building at Fukushima Daiichi Unit 3. And if you recall, that's the one that had the detonation. That's the one that had the huge explosion. And at the end of the week last week, they lifted one beam that was uh, not just radioactive. They're all radioactive, but extraordinarily radioactive. 
there was 54 rem. Um, now, what does that mean is uh, if you stood next to that beam for, for 10 hours, we call that LD 50-50, lethal dose 50% of the time. This is, you know, extraordinarily radioactive material. So, uh, you know, Tokyo Electric is putting that into a waste storage pit, et cetera. But the real question should be, one, how did that get there? You know, I've decommissioned power plants, and you find radiation everywhere, but you don't find 54 rem on a roof girder. That has to be from nuclear fuel. I think it's a clear indication that the nuclear fuel has been damaged and spread all throughout that building. You know, we're, we're working from the top down, and as you get into this plant, there's going to be areas that are even more radioactive. There's already reports that uh, human beings cannot work inside Unit 3. And, and the question is, how did that happen? It can only happen if there's nuclear fuel spread throughout the building. Two sources of nuclear fuel, it either came from the reactor or it came from the fuel pool. They've already found, back in, in March and April of 2011, they found pieces of nuclear fuel on the ground around Unit 3. And they've also found that the people working on Unit 4 next door are picking up their exposure from Unit 3. It's so radioactive, it's exposing the people working on the building next to it. So the message should be to the nuclear industry that you can have a detonation and nobody in the nuclear regulation wants to admit that. And you can spread not just iodine and cesium, but hot particles of nuclear fuel throughout the plant and, in fact, throughout the environment. And again, nuclear regulators are sticking their head in the sand and, and ignoring that. This week in Japan, regulators, nuclear regulators from around the world are meeting, but they're meeting behind closed doors. Kevin, can you talk about that? Yeah, it's most ironic that the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission's chairwoman, Allison McFarland, would even take part in a closed-door meeting like this. Apparently, indications are that it's being done so that the international regulators can speak candidly with each other. But, of course, this is uh, contrary to democratic norms. And, in fact, the Obama administration, one of President Obama's first acts in office back on Inauguration Day in 2009, was to commit his administration to being the most open, accountable, and transparent in U.S. history. And uh, holding nuclear safety regulatory meetings behind closed doors does not fit with that promise. You know, I referred to this, and, and many other have too, as, as a nuclear priesthood. And, uh, you know, when a bunch of regulators fly to Japan and have a closed door meeting, it reminds me a little bit of College of Cardinals flying off to Rome to close the doors, go into the Sistine Chapel, and, you know, the public has to sit outside and wait for white smoke to appear. Well, unfortunately, we're not seeing white smoke from Fukushima. We're seeing black smoke. And, and the problem is that regulators never did their job. You know, for them to blame the, the Japanese regulatory system now, in my opinion, is a joke. What I'd love to see is if one of our listeners can find where one of these people stood up before the accident and highlighted publicly that the system wasn't working in Japan. You know, now it's so painfully obvious to all of these regulators that the, the, the regulatory system broke in Japan. And Let's have a private meeting to discuss that. But in fact, it was obvious before that. They just never talked about it. If there's a listener out there who can find a publication where a regulator somewhere in the world chastised the Japanese before the accident about the condition, the breakdown of their regulatory system. I'd love to see it. Now, unfortunately, the accident prevention in the nuclear industry is, is always based on hindsight, and nobody ever really believes that what happened can happen again. So a closed-door meeting, what do you suppose they're talking about in there? Well, one of my first thoughts is it's very ironic that this is supposedly the reformed nuclear safety regulatory agency of Japan, and they're holding a closed-door meeting. That's a very bad sign for transparency and openness and accountability. That's no reform at all. That's actually, you know, as bad as or worse than what was in place before. So what they're talking about, I mean, as Arnie just talked about, the uh, extreme radioactivity levels found at Unit 3, they're still 
picking through the pieces of rubble to try to figure out what happened at Fukushima Daiichi and talk about lack of accountability. The, the four NRC commissioners who voted against radiological filters on hardened vents most recently here in the United States, how the United States can justify such a stand when the rest of the world has largely required filters on these uh, Fukushima twin designs. The only other countries that don't are uh, India and Mexico. So the United States is really sticking out like a sore thumb in the world in terms of uh, shortcuts on nuclear safety. Well, these are really high senior level policy people. And I think they're going to be not addressing detonation shockwaves or contamination. Uh, um, I hope what they're addressing is what Chairman Yasko has been talking about for the last two years. He was at the RIC, and we filmed him, and he's on one of our podcasts, where he specifically talks about the fact that we need to make these plants safe, and, and we need to make sure that we don't have to evacuate people for three or five or decades that these plants can withstand the worst without forcing the public to move. And you know, Chairman Nasco just said that again in an interview in Japan last year. The public needs a plant that they don't have to be afraid they've got to run 50 miles from uh, every time they, uh, they drive down the highway and take a look at it. So hopefully the direction in nuclear regulation is we've got to make sure these plants are 100% safe, that 99% safe is not good enough. All right, well, that about does it for today. Uh, again, Kevin Camps, thanks for joining us. Kevin is a radioactive waste specialist uh, with Beyond Nuclear. And Arnie, thanks both for coming on. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kevin and Kevin. Well, that about does it for this week's show. Make sure to catch us back here next Wednesday and every Wednesday for more on what's happening in the world of nuclear news and more technical nuclear discussion. Also, don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. For Fairwinds Energy Education, I'm Kevin Hurley. Thanks for listening. <laughs>